Falling in love for the first time is the stuff of romantic teen movies, schlock fiction, uh, pretty much every pop song that's ever been written. But for me, age 16, it was a complete unmitigated disaster because I fell in love with somebody of the wrong sex. And in 1966, gay men were still being sent to prison for four years. There weren't exactly a lot of role models around to tell you you could have a happy life. I quite honestly felt so guilty and so ashamed that I'd, I'd really rather have died than uh, tell anybody that I was in love with this other guy at school. And in fact, that was the option that I chose. I took an overdose of pills. Next morning, I woke up in a school dormitory and went, oh, God, I'm so useless, I can't even kill myself properly. And uh, had promptly had a nervous breakdown, age 16. They carted me off to mental hospital, and I spent six years in a therapeutic community, and it cured me. When I came out, I was no longer guilty or ashamed anymore. Anyway, two musician friends and I moved to London and formed a band with a view to making it. And uh, starting out in a band with a view to making it is like getting into a car with a view to getting there. <laughs> Unless you've got some idea of the destination you want to arrive at and roughly what route you're going to take to get there. So it is helpful to have a bit more of an idea than that, but we didn't. Uh, and we imagined when we got our first record contract that that uh, constituted making it because it was more than 98% of bands at the time ever achieved. And we got signed by Ray Davies of the Kinks to his private record label and we thought we were, you know, made for life. We were now pop stars official. And uh, Ray produced our first album and uh, the thing was we abdicated responsibility. We decided to just stick to writing songs and let the experts uh, do everything else. So they decided which songs we would record, they decided what the sound of those recordings would be, and they decided on how the marketing of it would take place. And as a result, the album sold 600 copies worldwide. It didn't get a single play on Radio 1. In other words, it never made it past the gatekeepers we might just as well not have made it. Because if you made a record in those days and you didn't get past the gatekeepers, nobody would ever hear it. There was no way around it. Now, in the meantime, having shed all that guilt and shame, uh, I pretty much um, went to the opposite extreme and uh, embraced gay liberation and quite literally made a song and dance about it. I <laughs> became uh, an activist for gay equality uh, in the 70s, you know, actually, if two men kissed in public in 1975, that was an act of gross indecency, punishable by two years in prison. And men were going to prison for gross indecency. The numbers of men in prison for being gay actually rose after supposed legalisation. Anyway, I won't get on my soapbox now, but it kind of resulted in a bit of a political awakening for me because um, you realised you either live in a free and a fair society, or you don't. And there's no point trying to campaign for people on the grounds of their sexuality to be treated as equal if you think a woman's place is in the home, or they should only get half the wages of men, or people with a different coloured skin are lesser citizens, or working people don't deserve fair treatment and consideration from their employers. So, fast forwarding a bit, in 1984, um, there were a lot of people collecting uh, with collector's tins for the miners' strike and they had these slogans on there saying, gays and lesbians support the minors. And I must admit, it kind of crossed my mind that maybe it wasn't mutual. <laughs> but I was wrong, because a gay pride on the main stage in front of five or 10,000 lesbians and gay men a miner's wife from the Welsh Valleys came onto the stage to thank the gays and lesbians for their contribution to the strike. And she said, I would be proud for any child of mine to be gay. So sometimes, you know, you have to make the first move. But anyway, my musical career had ground to a halt 
and my engagement as a campaigner was in full flow. And then along came punk rock. Suddenly it became clear that your passion for music and your passion for politics or engagement with the realities of daily life needed to come together. There's no point having your life compartmentalised. The thing would only work if it was authentic. It didn't have to be subtle, it didn't have to be clever, you didn't have to be able to play especially well. You it did have to engage direct with the audience rather than trying to mediate it through the music industry. So I walked out of the record deal, signed on on the doll, formed a new band and wrote a load of simple, loud, direct songs with choruses that you could sing along with. They had to be pretty simple because they had to be songs that a band could learn in the sound check. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't have a band. And then I'd call up people on the phone and say, are oh, you free on this date to come play drums for us? And I'd just get a band and scratch band together each time and we put it together on the fly that night, rehearse it in the afternoon at the sound check and then play them at the night. We also created Xerox newsletters to hand out to the audience because, you know, there was no email, there was no mailing list, there was no Facebook. So in order to engage with the audience directly, you wanted them to take away a piece of paper at the end of the gig that reminded them who they'd just seen, who was in the band, what the name of that guitar player was. By this time, we'd, start, we'd got down to a sensible, stable lineup. The newsletters had, like, uh, contact information for spare rib, for the gay switchboard for Rock Against Racism. It had funny reviews of weird places that we played, like Stowe Public School or Chelmsford Prison, and also details of all our upcoming gigs. So people started coming back to the gigs because they felt they were more engaged with this particular band. And we also had an address for the band where you could write to us, and anyone who sent us a stamped address envelope always got a reply. Um, that was a, a point of pride. The band would write back to anyone who wrote to us. Journalists started writing about us. And once they'd written about us, more people started coming along. When more people started coming along, more journalists kept coming along. And then when EMI Records came to see us, they couldn't get in the venue. And they could just see over the tops of these people's heads, everybody singing the words of the songs. So they signed us and we got past gatekeeper number two, having done the press first, then it got through to the record company. And this time we did it right. We had a hit song that we'd road tested night after night after night on the audience until you'd got it down to a kind of tempo that worked, a length that worked, taking out those crap lyrics that you got bored singing. And it focused up and gave us a song that connected. So then EMI had a record they could sell, they had a story they could tell, and the plugger from EMI got past gatekeeper number three, and we ended up being played on Radio 1 and having a hit record. And the modestly named Tom Robinson Band uh, had a brief 15 minutes of fame. Our next release, however, included a song called Sing If You're Glad To Be Gay. And it got into the top 20, but Radio 1 banned it and didn't play us again. The hits dried up, the band fell apart, and I had another nervous breakdown. Anyway, years later, I smoked a joint in Hamburg and got completely ripped off my tits and I wrote, a so <laughs> I wrote a song that was basically just a kind of psychotic rambling stream of consciousness. It didn't rhyme, it didn't even make sense, but it, ju it just kind of felt right. So I took this song around all the record companies in London, they all turned it down. So I put it out on my own label um, and Radio 1 decided they liked me again and started playing it. It went into the top ten. So that, if you like, is a kind of return on innovation. <laughs> then disaster struck once more. I fell in love with somebody of the wrong sex. Having established my name as a gay liberation campaigner, the man that wrote Sing If You're Glad To Be Gay, I went to a gay switchboard benefit and fell in love with a woman. I'm still married to her now, we have two fine kids, and uh, my particular return on that innovation is, th <laughs> is that our eldest graduated last year in computer engineering and walked straight into a coding job in Shoreditch. On the other hand, I never did have another hit record again after getting married, because priorities lay elsewhere. So, why on earth did Herb ask me to come and talk to you today? Um, well, because I was born in 1950, 
I witnessed at first hand the UK's rock and roll era, right the way through from the 50s to the present day. And I'm here to tell you that most of the innovation in that period has been driven by technology. In 1955, my brother bought his first Bill Haley and Elvis Presley records, and he bought them on shellac 78s and brought them home to play on the family gramophone, which you wound with a handle in a wooden case. The volume control were slats on the front that opened and shut. <laughs> and you had to go and buy needles from the record shop in order not to damage your 78s irreparably when you played Bill Haley. It was only about five years before things changed, and they changed utterly in two key ways, in a way that was driven by technology. The first was the start of mass music broadcasting in the UK, because cheap transistor radios started arriving from Japan. Transistor radios had been around in the 50s. They were a luxury item. <laughs> it was like $450 or something in, in the money of the day to buy the first portable transistor radio. But once the Japanese had cottoned onto it and started ma mass manufacturing them, suddenly teenagers could afford them. And you didn't have to listen to the family valve wireless set in the living room anymore. You could listen to the radio in the park or in your bedroom. But this created a huge vacuum because teenagers wanted pop music radio and the BBC was not prepared to give them it because the BBC had the light program and light entertainment was what the BBC did. Pop music was a kind of bastardized offspring of it that they didn't want anything to do with. Part of, but quite apart from that, they were completely held to ransom by the musicians' union, who, against threat of strikes, had severely limited the amount of records that could be played in any one day on BBC radio. It was called needle time. And to simply play pop records back to back was not an option. The BBC had 18 full-sized orchestras that they kept in full employment, and they played most of the music that you heard most of the time on BBC Radio. The whole reason why John Peel sessions and landmark sessions by people like Led Zeppelin, you know, that are in the BBC archives, is because the BBC had to have live music. They couldn't use needle time because of the MU. The mass broadcasting started because that vacuum was filled by Radio Luxembourg, broadcasting across the North Sea, and by pirate radio ships, broadcasting illegally outside British waters, non-stop records. They put musicians out of work, for sure. They didn't pay royalties to the songwriters, for sure. But they gave John Peel the single most influential DJ of all time, globally, his first job. The BBC would never have employed him, but Pirate Radio gave him a leg up. And by the time they closed down the pirate ships and started BBC Radio 1, Radio 1 was forced to give John Peel a job. So that was the start of mass broadcasting of pop music in the UK, once Radio 1 started up in 67, because of the transistor radio. But then there was the start of mass music retailing. Now, that's partly because of the broadcasting, but also the mass adoption of vinyl 45s and LPs. Those had existed in the 50s, but there wasn't a mass take-up of it. A, because they're expensive, but B, because teenagers couldn't play them. But once you got the invention of the transistor, you also got the invention of the electric record player, the portable electric record player. Now, at the beginning of the 60s, only the children of affluent parents could actually afford to have a portable record player. But by the end of the 60s, everyone had one. We all had access to a dance set. And because you had something that could play music, you then went out and bought music. So that vinyl started getting bought in industrial quantities. The next shift happened with the advent of integrated circuits at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. Massive change, again brought out because of the technology. First, it caused a drastic change in music creation. From Japan, once more, came cheap, programmable drum machines from the Roland Corporation, first ever. As a songwriter, I can't tell you how important that was. The, the old musicians joke, like, what's the difference between a drum machine and a, dr and a drummer? And the answer is, with a drum machine, you only have to punch the information in once. <laughs> if you had an idea for a song, you didn't have to get in a drummer. 
who could play in time and then persuade the drummer to play what you heard in your head the way you did it and then try and record it. You could just like program it up on this little rinky-dink machine and you could hear it. And then there came the four track <coughs> cassette recorder. Tascam, Tiac, uh, as they were then, created multi-track recording for the bedroom at an affordable price. This was possible because the Dolby circuitry that reduced the noise and made it possible to get four tracks onto a little tiny tape that big had come with integrated circuits. And you started to get bands that were no longer a garage band with a, one member to play bass, one member to play drums, one member to play guitar. You had just like two people in a bedroom with their little port studio, with their little drum machine, and then along came cheap synths, so they started doing those as well. All these things that existed before, but only for the rich. And when they become affordable, then you get the innovators, you get the new generation of songwriters and electro producers coming through. The third seismic shift I'm sure we've been talking about already, which is the arrival of the online connected world. It's funny to think now that Napster in 1999 was driven by dial-up. And the record companies, as always, got hold of the wrong end of the stick. You know like lizards can sh shed their tail if a predator attacks them? Record companies went right for the tail of the lizard. They thought that the problem was that their product was being given away down the telephone line for no money. They didn't realize the real threat was the many-to-many -many operation of how that, those connections were working. They fought among each other. Steve Jobs was ready with the iTunes store in Britain two years before the British record companies finally agreed to let their music be put on there, by which time the torrents had taken hold. And then the rise of broadband in the noughties, just like put the boot in. But the major record companies, there's three of them now. They've just eaten each other. Profit margins have dwindled and decimated the industry and changed the landscape beyond recognition. But now, in the 20 teens, the innovation is coming from mobile broadband and handheld devices. And what's left of the record industry is being shaken at its roots by Spotify. So, when Six Music offered me a job, giving up music and taking up being on the radio was like a small time chef getting a job as a restaurant critic. I jumped at the chance, you know. And then, when the MySpace era broke in about 2005, I began to find that the most interesting music was not coming from the record pluggers who were sending us stuff from the, the big companies. It was coming on MySpace, where nobody had heard of it at all. So I volunteered to move over to BBC Introducing and be part of that nurturing of new talent. And I now run a blog at Fresh on the Net that offers an open door and free insider advice to any musician who wants to make music outside the mainstream of the music industry. Now, I have two and a half minutes left, but I was talking to some students at Goldsmiths University last week, and I told them, contrary to all the doom and gloom that people of my generation pass on to them about why it's dodgy for you to even dream of making music now, there's never been a better time in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, noughties, or the 20 teens. There's never been a better time for genuine, gobsmacking talent to get heard. All the bets are off. Everything's changing fast and unpredictably. You still need self-belief and hard work, but basically all you have to be is good. You can make demos with a laptop and a pair of ears. A studio quality mic costs a hundred quid now. Unbelievably cheap compared to when I was young. You don't even have to own those things. You can borrow them off someone. Your song can get heard around the world for nothing with no radio play whatsoever. Once, a video cost 10 times more than the single that it was promoting to make. And now you can make it for free with your mobile in HD and edit it on a laptop. And millions can see and hear it by word of mouth. All it has to be is very, very good. And it will get heard. So my advice to those musicians was lower your standards. In order to get to those very, very good songs, the key to quality is quantity. The rule of nine states that only one piece of work in every ten will be any good. And just to reiterate the theme that we've heard in talk after talk today, the traditional music business is cutthroat and competitive, and the audience are consumers to be fleeced. In this new wired world, there's no need to treat other artists as 
competition or our audiences as consumers. Both of them are a potential community of collaborators. You can aim for collective action and cooperation. Why duplicate your effort? Share your rehearsal space. Do gig swaps with bands in other cities or house concerts put on by your supporters. Share your experience, share your equipment. If you need a great photographer, maybe somebody on your mailing list will be a better photographer than you could even dream of affording. If you need 10,000 quid to make an album, you can go on Kickstarter and pledge music and build up a campaign with your followers to raise that money. And for the first time in the whole history of the rock and roll era, a band can make, record and finish an album out of debt. And every copy sold from copy one is profit. That's never happened before. For the first time, there's no need for cash or insider contacts or the permission of gatekeepers for you to reach an audience. If you nurture a strong enough community around you, all you have to be is good.